What's up, Samurai Assassins? Fat Samurai Guy here, and welcome to another episode of The Movie Dojo, where we discuss martial arts cinema and action films. Today in the dojo, I'm going to review Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Sword of Destiny. Here's a quick plot synopsis. <coughs> Renowned warrior Yu Shu Lian comes out of retirement to keep the legendary Green Destiny Sword away from the villainous warlord Hades Dai. Now, for those of you that are unaware, Sword of Destiny is a sequel to the very influential and successful martial arts drama, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, directed by Ang Lee, starring Chai Yun-Fat, Michelle Yeoh, Zhang Ziyi, and Shaw Brothers legend, Chang Pei Pei. Not only did this film win 40 awards, including Best Foreign Film, it also did something more important, and that's opening the eyes of Western audiences to a genre they have never seen before. This genre is part of a kind of a flying swordsman type of series where these heroes are just so amazing, okay, that they use their martial arts chi or energy to achieve superhuman-like abilities. In a way, you can compare them to our superhero films that we have today. You got Superman flying around, you got Sean Young Fett's character flying around, bouncing lightly on the water. <laughs> a little leaf falls and he flies in the air and bounces off the one leaf. Believe me, when this movie came out, nobody was labeling this film as a badly acted, low-budget, chop-socky karate movie. This movie even made film snobs stop and have to pay attention. The film was gorgeous, had a beautiful soundtrack, had a very great acting performances, and very entertaining fight sequences. Choreographed by the legendary Yuen Wu Ping, responsible for the fight choreography in all three Matrix films, and more. One of the fun moments that I remember while I was actually in the theater seeing this back in the day was it was the fight sequence between uh, Michelle Yeoh and Zhang Ziyi. Not the amazing one-on-one -on -one dojo fight where they used all the weapons in the room, which is personally my favorite fight of the movie. But it was the fight where Michelle Yeoh was chasing Zhang Ziyi and they were running and flying across the rooftops of the buildings. And then at some point they both got grounded and they both went at it. After that fight sequence was done, and, and the fight scene was good, and, and the soundtrack, the drums, but I mean, the drums were just oh, pumping you up, and the fight scene was entertaining. When the fight scene was over, the audience, the American audience, erupted, cheered, clapped, went crazy as if they'd never seen anything like this before. Now, me, I was already educated in the genre, okay? <laughs> through bootlegs, through friends of mine, you know, I had copies of all kinds of movies and I knew the genre pretty well, so I was used to people flying around and fighting and all that kind of stuff. But since then, all the way up till now, I cannot really remember a time where I was in the movie watching an action film or martial arts movie or, or, or a movie in general and the crowd went crazy and erupted, cheered and applauded over a female on female fight sequence. Okay, I really cannot remember that. I mean, I can't really remember that if, on a male-on-male -male fight scene where the audience just jumped up and cheered and clapped. I mean, it was a cool experience. Another fun moment of watching this movie in the theater, we were about midway through the movie, okay? This movie's pretty lengthy. It's kind of long, but midway through, all right? We've already had flying, we've already had fighting, we've already had the unbelievable happen, okay? The amazing, all right? Uh, we're in the middle of the movie, and a couple in front of me basically turn to each other to talking about the film and I can kind of hear them a little bit while I'm watching the movie and the uh, male turns over to the female and he whispers he goes hey on this is a really cool movie like I'm really enjoying this movie but they still haven't explained why they can fly yet and that made me laugh I, I couldn't help but laugh at that so again you have to remember certain things are kind of accepted uh, within this type of genre nobody questions or asks why uh, Ryu, the character from Street Fighter, can just throw a fireball. Okay, <laughs> nobody goes, well, I just, they need to explain this, sir. So the popularity of this film was so high that movie studios over here were like, we got to bring some more of this foreign language martial arts stuff, man. The kids are going crazy. They're going crazy over here for it. So then films like House of Flying Daggers was released and Hero. And to my enjoyment, old school classics actually got releases here, like Jackie Chan's Drunken Master 2, but over here was released as Legend of the Drunken Master, and Donnie Yen's Iron Monkey. I remember when the Iron Monkey was over, there was a group of dudes behind me, and they were like, yeah, that was a kick-ass kung fu film, man, yeah, the special effects weren't that great, but, you know, it was still kick-ass, I enjoyed it. So me being me jumped in, 
And I was just saying, well, you know, back in 1993, they didn't really have the technology yet. And they were all confused. They were like, 1993? Dude, this movie was released this weekend. And laughingly, I told them, I was like, no, man, this is an old movie. They just re-released it now. But this film came back. This is, this is old, man. This is 1993. They were stunned. They were like, what? <laughs> A kick-ass movie like this? It's this old? Shit! So then I had to, you know, uh, you know, give myself some props there, you know. Uh. And then I started to notice that the popularity for this type of genre kind of started to die. Uh, you didn't really see any more major releases to multiple theaters for these foreign language martial arts films. It kind of just died off. I mean, I'm thinking hard on it right now, but I think Jet Li's movie Fearless was probably the last mainstream release of a foreign language uh, martial arts movie. Well now, 16 years later, we finally get a sequel to this film, and this time it's directed by Yuen Wu Ping, starring Donnie Yen, and Michelle Yeoh comes back again to reprise her role from the first movie. All right, let's get to Sword of Destiny. Now I'm gonna give you the good, I'm gonna give you the bad, I'm gonna give you the badass. First up, the good. So for a film being released straight to Netflix, the movie doesn't look that bad for its budget. The acting performances from Donnie Yen and Michelle Yeoh are solid, and at times, the movie kind of had that throwback to the old school feel to it. For example, you got this scene at a tavern where uh, these bounty hunters kind of messing and harassing uh, Donnie Yen's character. So we have our group of ragtag warriors throughout the tavern basically wanting to join in Donnie Yen's quest and help him out. But they couldn't just do that. Each warrior had to stand up, say their name, and say where they're from. I mean, that's straight up old school, man. I am Dragonfly from the Dragon Clan. Just finishing my dragon soup, and I'm here to use dragon style for the tournament. Stuff like that made me smile a little bit. And as always, the concept of a small group of people taking on overwhelming odds never gets old to me. Another thing I liked was that you would hear the Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon theme song played throughout the movie. Now for the bad. Now if you're expecting the same type of quality acting, uh, beautiful looking sets and cinematography, you're probably going to be disappointed. Some of the CGI and green screen effects uh, ranged from decent, you know, okay to... Ooh. Even though the overall story of the film is average, there's still some problems with it. And having little to no character development is one of them. You don't really care about a lot of the characters in the movie. I mean, even some of our ragtag warriors that joins the fight. When stuff happens to them throughout the course of the movie, the movie tries to give you that little emotional punch, but it just didn't work. You just didn't care. And the romance bullshit with the characters of Snow Boss and Wei Fang just seemed really forced and just really lame. To the point where the character Wei Fang is holding Snow Boss in his arms and he goes, I can't lose you. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Were you guys in love or something? Were you guys supposed to be in love? I, 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 oh, okay, movie. Sure, all right, they love each other. Okay, where the hell did that come from? I mean, physical attraction, I get it, okay, I get it, but, uh, love? <sighs> it's like the writers went out of their way and they were thinking like, well, you know, what made the first movie successful? Flying, uh, fighting, and love. So we got the flying, we got the wire foo going, okay, and we got the fighting, uh, but we ain't got no love, so we need to come up with something at the last minute. And the only reason you care about Michelle Yeoh and Donnie Yen is because it's Michelle Yeoh and Donnie Yen. <laughs> but even their love subplot felt really rushed. So in the first Crouching Tiger, Michelle Yeoh and Chan Yun Fat couldn't be together because she was already in an arranged marriage to the Donnie Yen character. Michelle thought Donnie Yen died, but what actually happened, Yen got into a duel a long time ago, years ago, with Jason Scott Lee's character of Hades and ended up falling off of a cliff and was presumed dead. So then Donnie Yen's character ends up surviving and decides to live in the mountains to train to get better in case he fights Hades again. And he also changed his identity so that Michelle Yeoh and Chang Yun Fat could be together. So obviously once Michelle Yeoh found out about all of this, she was pissed off. And that was really it for their characters. They basically both met, they sat down at a table, and had five minutes of exposition between each other. And then after that, they just went their own way, and that was it. They would speak to each other a little bit here and there throughout the movie, but that was pretty much it for their characters. And there was also some throwaway characters in this movie, like this one female who had these mystical powers. She really, 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 really badly wanted to kill Michelle Yeoh for revenge. But the movie didn't really do a great job of explaining in detail who she is and why she wants revenge. 
It was almost like the filmmakers were like, well, you know, we gotta have Michelle Yeoh fight somebody at the end. Now, even though the film was not boring, it did have some pacing issues. So you have a scene where Donnie Yen's left arm gets wounded and slashed. And Michelle Yeoh's character comes up to him, you know, to try to help him out and heal him. Meanwhile, Donnie Yen is just out of it, man. He's really hurt. And literally, it felt like it was just five minutes have passed when uh, Donnie and Michelle Yeoh and all our ragtag heroes kind of show up Avengers style <laughs> at Jason Scott Lee's castle. Donnie Yen completely healed and perfectly fine. I mean, I couldn't help but laugh at it. I was like, wait a minute. He was just hurt. Wait, what the? Yeah, woo! Attack! <laughs> the finale and the end of the film felt really rushed. But really what kind of bugged me, I don't know if this is a controversial issue or something not to bring up, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm my own man, okay? <laughs> I can say what I want. It's my channel, damn it. But I kind of hate to say this, but I didn't like that the film was in English. I just did not like it. I, something felt off. The film just didn't feel authentic. It's not like the acting was terrible. It's not like the English was not spoken well. It just didn't feel right within the universe. I mean, I was begging for the Mandarin language. But that's just my preference. Now for the badass. Now there's all kinds of fans of different types of martial arts genres out there. Some like the more realistic, grounded fight choreography. Some like the usual typical wire foo, where they're flying around type of fight choreography. But then there are some people who just hate. They hate when people are flying around, it looks ridiculous, it's fake, it's not real. And that's perfectly fine, that's your preference, I totally get it. And even me at some point, especially with the films that came out in the mid-2000s, it seemed like less real martial art technique was being shown and everybody was just flying around and that was it. When everybody's just flying around, I have a problem with it. But that's what's awesome about Yuan Wu Ping was that his films will have crazy insane wire foo, people spinning like this and flying this way and doing all this crazy superhero stuff, but then he will have moments where the fighting is down and grounded and you see unbelievable fighting technique and just amazing martial arts being displayed on film. He's like the best of both worlds, man. That's why this guy's great. But how were the fight scenes in this movie? I'm happy to say that the swordplay action sequences are very well done. It's nothing really mind-blowing or on the level of the dojo fight from the first movie, but you kind of have to remember, Donnie Yen and Michelle Yeoh are in their 50s. <laughs> but surprisingly enough, Michelle Yeoh still moves well, and Donnie Yen, that guy just never loses his speed. He's just as fast as ever. And even Jason Scott Lee actually does a good job in the physical fight scenes. After seeing him in this movie, I kind of wish that maybe after he played uh, Bruce Lee in the Bruce Lee biopic Dragon, that he should have just went straight to Hong Kong, man, <laughs> or Japan, or trying to make action films over there. But unfortunately, he decided to stay here in the States, and he ended up playing Mowgli in the live action version of The Jungle Book. And then he disappeared. I mean, it was cool seeing him in Soldier, and he had that really good fight with Kurt Russell at the end, but... Jason Scott Lee disappeared. So it was nice to see him fighting on screen again. I really enjoyed the fight scene where it was Michelle Yeoh and Donnie Yen back to back defending against Hades men who was there to steal the Green Destiny sword. The fighting was very fluid and exciting and towards the end of the fight there was this one shot, this one camera angle above showing both of them and man I mean it was only for a few seconds so it was like maybe four or five seconds but the fight choreography is beautiful. I mean, just swords all over the place. No one slowing down for another person. And when that above camera shot happened and that fight choreography was going on, I was like, ah, there, there's you, Wen Ping. There you are. I was waiting for you. And I also enjoyed the sword fight on the frozen lake. It was pretty interesting seeing Don Yen fight these two guys uh, while sliding around on the ice. So overall, this film pales in comparison to its predecessor in every way. However, I have to give props to Donnie, Michelle, and Yuan Wu Ping for doing the best they could with what they were given. So for a sequel that took way too long to happen, and our leads being in their 50s, and it's straight to Netflix budget stacked against them, I can still honestly say that even though the movie does have its flaws, it's still an entertaining watch. And I highly recommend that you check it out on Netflix. Not perfect, but still fun. So I give Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Sword of Destiny. 3.5 out of 5 ninja stars. So that's it for today's episode of The Movie Dojo. If you have seen Sword of Destiny, let me know what you thought about it in the comments below. And again, thanks for watching. You guys rock. And tune in next week for my review of The Golden Cane Warrior. See you guys next time. Like, share, subscribe. Like.
like, share, subscribe.